good afternoon, everybody. Salamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Sousa Nuilati. I'm Senior Academic Consultant at the Vitro Retinal Division at Kekesh. And today's topic is choroidal neovascularization. This is a topic that I've been giving for over 25 years. And it's one of those topics where every year something new happens and you have to update your lecture. So it keeps me always very excited. Um, today, we're going to talk, let's talk about the basics um, information, basic information of CNV, and then we will review the treatment of CNV in general. So what is choroidal neovascularization or CNV? It is merely the growth of chorea capillaries through a break in Brooks membrane, either under the retinal pigment epithelium, as you can see here, or through the retinal uh, pigment epithelium under the retina. Now, choroidal CNVs can happen anywhere in the eye. They can definitely happen in the periphery, but they have a predilection for the macula. And they, in this case, they could be either extrafoveal, we're going to see that in a moment, or juxtafoveal or subfoveal, and we're going to see those definitions in a moment. Now, in general, choroidal neovascularization has a poor natural history because it creates uh, scarring, it creates a, a healing response. So it does cause a significant loss of central vision if it happens in the macula. Why is that? Because the choroidal vessels will leak fluid because that's what chorea capillaries do. They tend to leak, they are fenestrated capillaries. So they're going to leak fluid, blood and lipid. This is going to disturb the retinal function and it causes the RPE to start to proliferate and uh, uh, um, bring, bring up fibrosis, and this causes loss of central vision, as you can see here. Now, what is the pathogenesis? As I mentioned, it's a wound healing response to injury of the chorea capillaries, Brooks membrane, and RPE complex. Therefore, any injury, any kind of injury, inflammatory, traumatic, or age-related, what have you, any injury to any of those structures, chorea capillaries, Brooks membrane, or RPE, can by itself induce choroidal neovascularization. And what uh, allows this uh, CNV to growth is a balance actually between the, the anti-angiogenic factors and the angiogenic factors. Uh, the angiogenic factors, we know one of them, very famous, it's called the vasoendothelial growth uh, factor. And the anti-angiogenic factors are uh, the factors that the retina of the RPE uh, secretes to kind of you know, calm down this growth of the CNV. So, the VEGF is correlated with the development of CNV, and it's found, if you, if you take specimens of CNV, you'll find VEGF inside it, okay? And its overexpression, as we mentioned, will induce the CNV. And the VEGF is going to bind to the endothelial cell receptors, and the, it's going to start to act to increase the vascular permeability of the cells, it's going to cause endothelial proliferation, cell migration, and the uh, uh, CNV therefore derives from angiogenesis, which could be from pre-existing blood vessels, okay, and vasculogenesis, which are creation of de novo blood vessels that did not exist before, okay. Now, as I said before, any cause, anything that can disturb, disturb this RPE Brooks membrane chorea capillaris complex can lead to discoform scarring uh, and, and CNV and discoform scarring. So what are the causes? By far, the most common cause is age-related macular degeneration. But then again, you also have degenerative myopia because myopia tends to thin out the Brooks membrane and stretch it. So it can, uh, you know, it can lead to CNV, inflammations at that level, tra trauma to the eye, enjoyed streaks, which are also breaks in Brooks membrane. Um, uh, idiopathic can sometimes happen after uh, certain inflammatory uh, conditions, particularly in the young people. Uh, tumors that, dis that disturb the RPE Brooks membrane complex, retinal tail injection as well. We talked about this last time and last week, and even retinal dystrophies. How does a CNV present? What, what do patients complain of? Well, they're going to complain of changes in their central vision. It could be metamorphopsia, which is like when the lines start to appear a little bit wavy and crooked, or sometimes they can complain of a sudden um, or a, a slow ongoing um, central scotoma. Uh, but sometimes the, the disturbances are just like blurry vision. They cannot really explain. So, but if a patient comes in and any patient that actually comes in and says, you know, I don't read very well as, um, um, you know, as well as before, I'm, I'm not seeing the, uh, the lines very, very clearly. Uh, this requires a prompt examination, okay? No delay. All right. So what are the signs? What would you see if, you have, if there is a CNV? Well, the signs of CNV is primarily the presence of subretinal 
lipid, subretinal blood, as we can see here, and subretinal fluid. Because as I said, the, these cori capillaries are going to leak those elements from the vessels. You can also have a grayish ring, okay, that you can see. And here is our other examples of subretinal blood. Now, you can also have indirect signs, such as, uh, especially in chronic cases where you have so much leakage that the retina starts to have a cystoid macular edema. So you can have cystoid macular edema in elevated retina. And here is another example of lipid even far away from the, from the CNV complex itself. You can also have pigment epithelial detachments, particularly in the occult type of membranes in AMD, where the membranes, this, where the choroidal um, chorea capillaries grow under the RPE, and they for, therefore they lift the RPE and they cause uh, um, a fluid um, uh, exudation there. Therefore, you can have a pigment epithelial detachment. And at, at a later stage, uh, things start to fibrose down, so you can have subretinal fibrosis. All these are signs of CNV. Remember one thing is subretinal blood in my dictionary is choroidal neovascularization until proven otherwise, okay? If you have subretinal blood, that is what you should be looking for in the first that, that's number one. Now, that doesn't mean that every subretinal blood is a choroidal neovascularization. Of course, you can have other causes. Example, if you have macroaneurysms of the of the retinal arteries, if the blood is if the blood is thick, it can di definitely dissect from the retina to under the retina. It, it, sometimes you have cracks in uh, in myopia, which we call lacquer cracks. And if you have a, a sudden crack, this can also cause a little bit of bleeding without the egress of uh, choroidal neovessels, traumatic choroidal ruptures by the same mechanism, uh, a vitreous detachment, a sudden vitreous detachment. If, if you have bleeding on the uh, traction on vessels that bleed, and again, the blood can dissect under the retina. Choroidal tumors, of course, they can also bleed. So any retinal vascular disease in which intraretinal hemorrhage dissects under the retina can actually give you subretinal blood. And what about fluid? Well, we saw last week that you know other things can cause fluid in the eye, central serous chorioretinopathy, inflammatory conditions such as harada and posterior scleritis, uveal effusions, and any choroidal tumor that can leak, of course, they can give you subretinal fluid. But remember, subretinal blood is CNV until proven otherwise, and you'll be safe. Now, if you have a CNV, if you suspect one, okay, what should you do? As I said, you need to do a prompt examination. Examine the patient that same day or the next day. Do not let the patient wait. How do you examine? Well, you want to examine clinically. Of course, we already said that. Now you're suspecting it. Now you want to confirm it. How do you confirm it? Well, with utilization of any of these techniques, either together or just one of them, depending on your expertise. Now, fluorescein angiography is, has been the standard of uh, diagnosing CNV, and you will need early and mid and late, and late phases, uh, preferably stereoscopic, but not necessarily. It's going to confirm the presence of a CNV. We're going to talk about this in a moment, and it will identify the type of CNV, the location of the CNV, and even the size of the CNV. But do we always need it? Not really, because now optical coherence tomography has become so, um, the resolution has become so good, you know, that uh, most, uh, most of the signs of the CNV can be detected on an OCT, uh, especially uh, inexperienced uh, pay, uh, doctors, you know, they would tell you whether this is a CNV or not, but it doesn't always replace it. Sometimes there are still, you know, uh, questionable uh, lesions where you need to do a fluorescein angiography. So it, it adds info and it's extremely useful and non-invasive. Now there is also the optical coherence tomography angiography, which is newer. It is not invasive. It relies on the fact that you uh, it detects you know changes uh, of flow inside the vessels. So uh, all the vessels are going to appear uh, whitish, such, such as this, you know, and uh, it will uh, you know show you the vessels of the retina, both in the inner retina and in the outer retina and in the chorea capillaris. So if you go, you know, layer by layer from inner to outer, you're gonna in, in if if you have a CNV, you're gonna see these networks of vessels. It's not always as easy and as clear as this, and then you can determine that there is flow by these signals, okay? So this is a non-invasive way to determine the presence of CNV, but if it does not show you leakage. It just show, shows you the structural uh, anomalies of the, uh, uh, the network itself, the vascular network. So let's go, let's see how an, um, a CNV looks on FA. And FA is the gold standard to confirm the diagnosis of CNV. Here is a grayish membrane, and here it is on the fluorescein angiography, and you can see this, you know, hyperfluorescent uh, leak. Uh, lesion with the hypofluorescent rim. I'm going to see that in a moment. So it's going to confirm it. It's going to identify its type. Now, we don't much talk about the types of CNV nowadays in the anti-VEGF era, but this, this used to be very important, and it is important for you to know, okay? So the types of CNV are classic, occult, 
polypoidal and retinal angiomatous proliferation, four main types. How are they? CNV type one, what is what we call an occult neovascularization is when the cori capillaries grow from the cori capillaries layer under the RPE. So what is lifted is the RPE and the growth happens here. A lot, if not most of the uh, CNVs in AMD, in age-related macular degeneration, are occult types of membranes. They grow under the RPE and don't necessarily go and invade the RPE. So they're, they're called occult or type one. A CNV type two, is what we call a classic membrane, is when the capillaries have grown through the retinal pigment epithelium and now are above the RPE and between the neurosensory retina and the RPE. That is a classic membrane. They're very, very clearly visible on FA. We're going to see this in a moment. Um, and they're very aggressive, actually. A type... Um, uh, 3CNV is um, what we call a retinal angiomatous proliferation. In this case, you have vessels inside the retina that connect to cori capillaries through conduits, through little corridors. And so you have transretinal neovascularization, and a lot of it um, eventually settles, you know, under the retina and sometimes even under the pigment epithelium. They're very difficult to treat. Uh, juxtaphobial telangiectasia mactel tends to be uh, this type of, uh, you know, it, it leads to this type of neovascularization, all right? Now, and polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy is very, very similar to type 1, the CNV. These are little um, uh, conduits of uh, cori capillaries that end in saccular dilations like polyps, okay, like bulbs under the RPE, and they uh, behave a little bit differently than an occult membrane, but they are situated exactly in the same position under the retinal pigment epithelium. Now, Let's look at the classic one. We're going to move uh, from inner to outer. So a classic type CNV, we said, is the one that goes through the RPE and under the uh, neurosensory retina. How does it demonstrate itself on a fluorescent angiography? Well, you're going to see a very early on an early hyperfluorescent. And this hyperfluorescence uh, is going to start to, uh, you know, uh, become bright as soon as you get choroidal filling, you know, so very, very early. And then uh, as, you, as you go through the angiogram, the, uh, there is an increase in the intensity of the fluorescence and as well fuzziness of the lesion. And the lesion is usually well demarcated. So it's early hyperfluorescence with well demarcated boundaries and late leakage. This is the classic definition of a classic CNV, type 2 CNV. Here's a grayish membrane of a CNV extrafoveal. Here it is. You see it very early on in the angiogram. And later on, in the late phases the, on the angiogram, you see the hyperfluorescence that is intense, intensely leaking and fuzzy, no longer well demarcated. Now, on an OCT, how does this present? Well, it is a hyperreflective lesion that goes through the RPE. Now, if this is the RPE, and you, got, you guys know that this is the RPE because it's the most hyperreflective uh, layer, you know, on an OCT, you're going to see that there is something like a like structure here that is going through the RPE and uh, under the neurosensory retina, which is right there. Here is the neurosensory retina with this uh, somehow thickened photoreceptors. Okay, and the uh, this goes um, above here, leaving uh, clear fluid. So this is um, a CNV that is classic. It is, has gone through the RPE under the neurosensory retina. It is surrounded by clear fluid, and uh, it um, it has some hyperreflective uh, fluid on top of it. Okay, now an occult type CNV. We said that it. Hello. Um, uh, okay, if nobody's talking to me directly, nobody has a question, please mute yourself. Okay, so an occult type 1 CNV is a, is a CNV that is under, that is that remains localized under the pigment epithelium. So it lifts the pigment epithelium a little bit. So this is why we call it a fibrovascular PED. So it's a pigment epithelial detachment, but it's, it doesn't have just fluid under it. The pigment epithelial detachment under it has fibrovascular tissue, okay, vessels that are now fibrosing. So what you will see here is that you will have, um, uh, if, especially if you have a stereoscopic uh, FA, you're going to see an elevation of the, RP, of the RPE, and you may have well or poorly demarcated boundaries, and you will definitely see leakage well but the leakage happens kind of throughout the end. This is a classic membrane. This part here is a classic membrane. You could see it early on and you see leakage, hyperintense fl uh, fluorescence and fuzziness indicating leakage. But this is the part that where you have a pigment epithelial detachment and, and vessels under the pigment epithelial detachment. This is the part that is occult. Notice that you cannot really define it very, very clearly early on, but throughout the middle phases of the angiogram, you start to see it. This is what we call a fibrovascular PED. Now, occult type CNV can also uh, be, um, um, 
present itself differently on a fluorescein uh, in some, something that we call late leakage of undetermined source. And just from the name, you can tell that basically you have kind of uh, irregular speckled hyperfluorescence. You don't really know where it starts, where it finishes. The demarcation is always poor and you can never determine the source of leakage. But then somehow towards the end of the angiogram, you're seeing this, this hyperfluorescence all over here. You don't know the boundaries of the CNV. This is also an occult CNV. Now an occult CNV, again, will present under the pigment epithelium. Notice this is the Brooks membrane. This is the RPE and the Brooks membrane here. And between the Brooks membrane and the pigment epithelial detachment, you're going to have a multi-layered uh, structure, hyperreflective structure that is the fibrovascular membrane. And it has uh, leakage, uh, subretinal leakage, not a sensor retinal detachment. Here's one of my patients. And this is a very clear uh, picture here in which you can see the hyperreflective pigment epithelial detachment. Here it is. It is above right there. So all this under it is the choroidal neovascular membrane. Here you have clear subretinal fluid. Here you also have a little bit of clear subretinal fluid, but also hyperreflective material, which was what we call subretinal hyperreflective material, uh, or SHREM for short. Uh, the, this has been going on for a while, so the patient is getting a cystoid macular edema as well. And here you have these uh, irregular PEDs. Okay, so now what I want you to you know know is that uh, Occult CNV is a, dif is a definite uh, definition, but if you have features that block the boundaries of the CNV, that is not, that you should not call that CNV. Could somebody, uh, I'm, I'm hearing interference. Could you please mute yourself? Thank you. Hello? Okay. So what are the features that can block the, the boundaries of a CNV? Thick blood, okay? You can have thick blood, and now you don't see the boundaries very clearly, but the boundaries, this doesn't mean that this is an occult CNV. An occult CNV is something that is under the pigment epithelium, okay? Very, very definite. Definite. This is. These are just features that block the visibility. You can have a hyperplastic RPE, which also will show you hypo, hypofluorescence on a, on a fluorescein angiogram, because the pigment epithelium is, is, you know, hyperplastic. It has a lot of melanin, so it's going to block the visibility. And sometimes you can have a serous PED, uh, a pigment epithelial detachment that has a lot of fluid and the fluid blocks the visibility of your um, CNV. So what uh, the definitions, you need to know them well. A CNV lesion is a lesion that has all these co uh, components that I talked to you about. So what are the components of a CNV? The, the, the same, the, the vessels themselves, any thick blood that surrounds them, the elevated block fluorescence and a serous PED, all these are lesion components. Now, why is this important? Because we, um, in the past, we, need, we needed to make a differentiation between classic membranes and occult membranes because the treatment response was a little different um, when we treated them. But I don't want to bore you with it. Just remember, because you're going to see these terms and you may not know. So a predominantly classic CNV is a lesion a CNV lesion, okay, in which the classic component, which we see here, here it is, this is the classic component, and here too, the classic component makes up more than 50% of the entire lesion. Here you have an occult CNV component, here you have a, a classic component, classic component, a little bit of blood, all this is the lesion, and the classic part makes more than 50%. We call that predominantly classic. Minimally classic, simple, is where the classic part of the lesion is less than 50% of the whole surface area. Here's the whole surface area. This is the blood right there. This is the entire lesion, but the classic component is very little. And an occult is when you don't, you don't have any classic at all. So this is not too important for you. Let's look at CNV type three, which is the wrap lesion. How does this present? You will see early hyperfluorescence, okay? And progressive late leakage. And there's often a little tiny speck of hypofluorescence corresponding to a tiny hemorrhage, intraretinal hemorrhage. And an OCT is very characteristic. You see cystoid spaces such as these, okay, and pigment epithelial detachments. Uh, these are difficult to treat. And the last one is the polypoidal CNV, in which you have, as I said earlier, these uh, uh, conduits and um, uh, branching retinal, uh, bra I'm sorry, branching networks of vessels that end in a, in, in a sacular 
molecular dilations. Um, you see them very much better on an ICG, especially if you don't have a lot of blood. If you have a lot of blood, the ICG is not useful. But if you don't have a lot of blood, then you can start to see these, these uh, saccular dilations and the network. And the OCT is very, very helpful because the OCT will show you the polyps right on, uh, at, on the undersurface of the pigment epithelium where it's attached. Uh, here's the Brooks membrane, and here are the polyps very, very nicely. Here's another one that was uh, that I've taken from uh, um, um, a, a study that came out from Kekesh uh, that's published in clinical ophthalmology by Dr. Iman Gahtani and Dr. Ghazi. Um, here you can see the on a fluorescein angiogram, you know, these uh, hyper um, fluorescent leakage, not very clear, but the ICG clearly demarcates uh, and shows these polypodal lesions. And it shows you also the, the branching network. There's a branching uh, network. And here are here is the pigment epithelial detachment, which is often either M-shaped or QRS-shaped, you know, whatever. It has this little notch. And if you look very carefully, you're going to see the polyps right at the under surface of the pigment epithelial detachment. So fluorescein, therefore, diagnoses. Fluorescein and geography determines which type, uh, in addition sometimes to uh, ICG, of course, and, and OCT. And it identifies the location, which used to be very important for our treatment practices. Uh, we the, These are terminology that you guys need to know. You don't, don't invent the location by calling, uh, um, you know, um, a juxtafoveal one, an extrafoveal one. No, that's not correct. You need to know what the definitions are. An extrafoveal one is a lesion uh, in which the edge is at between 200 microns, okay, so a little bit more than the thickness of the vein. A vein is about 150 microns in, in, in diameter. So the, if the lesion edge is at 200 microns, okay, to anywhere uh, beyond that, that is called from the center of the FAZ. So if you, this is the center of the FAZ, and it's approximately, the FAZ is approximately 350 to 500. Let's say it's 400. So the radius here is about 200. Okay, so if you are at the edge of the FAZ, this is an already an extra foveal membrane, all right? A juxtafoveal membrane is when the lesion edge is anywhere between 200 or 199, if you wish, and the center, which is one micron, very difficult to <laughs> determine. And a subfoveal lesion is when any part of the lesion is smack under the fovea. Now, this is what we call an extra foveal. So you guys will probably tend to call it juxtafoveal. It's not. It is by definition, it's an extra foveal lesion, and this is a subfoveal lesion. All right. Now, once the diagnosis is confirmed, what are you going to do? You, the next thing is to, to, to determine why. Why does this person have CNV? Okay, they, CNVs don't grow out just like out of nothing. I, I told you that you need to have an irritation, some kind of a pathology of the Brooks membrane and the RPE uh, complex. So you need to identify what is the cause and then start the treatment. The biggest cause, as I said earlier, is age-related macular degeneration, and we can define it as an alteration of the macular retina and the RPE and the choroid as the eye matures, and it's a leading cause of blindness in people over the age of 50, as particularly in the West. Now, the risk factors, some of them are non-modifiable, such as genetic factors and age, but some are modifiable, such as cigarette smoking, obesity, and um, basically a low level of antioxidants in the diet that can promote CNV. All right, and we classify age-related macular degeneration in either early or late. What are early? Early is when you have drusen, okay, and RPE changes. Late AMD is when these drusen and uh, RPE changes start to uh, generate, you know, uh, atrophy of the outer retina uh, and the cori capillaries and the RPE, which we call geographic atrophy, or when they uh, irritate the RPE so much that you start to get neovascular complications, which is what we're talking about today, CNV, pigmented epithelial detachment, and discoform scarring. Now, drusen, drusen are, are markers of AMD. You cannot have AMD without drusen, okay? So if you see a, a patient with CNV that doesn't have drusen, you know, question yourself, you know, what are we, what are we doing here? What, what are we talking about? What, are, what other causes are there? So the markers of AMD are drusen. The, uh, these are um, uh, focal deposits under the laminar, under the basement membrane of the RPE, or under the, the, the cytoplasmic membrane, the, the, uh, the cell membrane of the RPE, okay? We talked about this in the basic science course 
about two weeks ago. So lam basal laminar drusen or basal linear drusen, depending on where they are. They tend to be in the macula, but they can also be peripheral. Uh, hard uh, um, drusen are, tend to be sharply demarcated and small, and they're not at, you know, they, they're not high risk for AMD, for, I'm sorry, for CNV, but soft drusen are the larger ones. Okay, and they tend to be more more fuzzy, less defined, and they tend to uh, you know become confluent, and they are uh, the high risk. How do you see drusen on OCT? Well, very very nicely. Here is a pigment epithelial um, layer, and you see it elevated. Okay, it's hyperreflective and it's elevated, and because the debris is under the RPE, you tend to see the Brooks membrane line. Oops, I'm sorry, the Brooks membrane line very clearly. This is the ellipsoid zone. It you know elevates itself above the RPE. Uh, and then sometimes, sometimes actually at the top, it gets lost a little bit. So this is how a drusen looks like. Now the risk factors for CNV in AMD is when you have large drusen, okay? When you have drusen middle, um, you know, middle sized or larger, more than 63 microns in diameter, when they tend to be more confluent, when they ha you have additional pigmentary changes and relative hyperfluorescence, th this is a high risk for CNV. Geographic atrophy uh, is a late but dry AMD. It, uh, you know, you don't necessarily, it comes in, it can come in without uh, CNV uh, before that. Uh, what you get basically uh, fine pigmentary changes and uh, drusen that coalesce and, and just die and give you an atrophy uh, that will uh, show up like this, you know, with a thinning of the RPE and then leading to inverse shadowing. Okay. So uh, here, you, you, the best way to see uh, geographic atrophy is with autofluorescence because it exhibits it really, really nicely. W generally, the area around the geographic atrophy tends to have hyper uh, autofluorescent RPE because the RPE is sick and trying to cope. Okay, and there are uh, certain patterns here that have been associated with um, faster development of geographic atrophy, but that's not the, the subject of our talk today. Okay, now let's go back to CNV. So CNV, happens in about 10% of patients who have uh, AMD, but is the, the biggest giver of visual loss, okay? So you can have classic versus occult. Here is a classic membrane, for instance. Uh, often um, in AMD, the CNV grows quite a lot and it, it creates a lot of scarring. <clears throat> Here's one, this, this is one of my patients. Um, he had a, a CNV that started like this. Notice that this is exactly the same eye. And within two years, this is what happened, okay? And he actually, this, the, 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 the CNV is still growing. So there's a quite poor natural history. Now, CNV can be under the pigment epithelium you know, and creating quite a large pigment epithelial detachment, we, you know, uh, such as a serous PED right there. Often you have a notch that tells you where the CNV is. You can have hemorrhages under the pigment epithelial detachment, we call that hemorrhagic PED, or drusenoid PEDs when you have um, a lot of, um, you know, lipoficient and uh, hyperfluorescent material and debris under the pigment epithelium associated with the CNV. So all these are signs of neovascular AMD. Okay, we already said that natural history is poor. Okay, uh, particularly in classic membranes, occult membranes may not be as poor, but you know, just remember one thing, AMD uh, gives CNVs that are difficult to treat and eradicate, you need treatment for life, and the prognosis is not so good, okay? Um, this is a class, you're gonna see this. If you if you look at this publication, you will see the classification of, of uh, AMD. And I think I have that in the hand, in the handout, which will you will receive. All right, now what is the second cause of AMD, uh, of CNV is degenerative myopia, which is a leading cause of blindness nowadays in the world. Uh, it's defined as um, um, a refractive error of, um, yeah, of more than six diopters, um, and, and more than plus six diopters um, in power. And the axial length, uh, uh, is above 26 uh, millimeters in diameter. And what the, with generative myopia, you get progressive uh, stretching of the ocular uh, tissues, the RPE and the choroid and the retina, and the, you can get breaks in Brooks membrane. And um, also like uh, uh, circular geographic atrophies in the posterior pole, all, all of which we can, leave to, can lead to C CNV. How do you know that you have myopia? Okay, or well, you're dealing with a myopic fundus because you have what we call a myopic conus, which is the out, you know, the 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 
backward bulging. Uh, I'm sorry, not the backward bulging. Myopiconus is the, the uh, juxtapapillary uh, chorioretinal atrophy that you see here, like a cone, okay? A staphyloma, which is the posterior bulging of the, of the globe. And uh, the staphyloma can be nasal, can be uh, macular, can be a combination. Um, this, there's a specific uh, curtain classification for uh, posterior staphylomas in myopia, which one day maybe we can have a chance to talk about. Uh, you have RPE in coral thinning. You have these atrophic areas that you can see right there, and the lacquer cracks, which can give macular hemorrhages and what we call Fuchs spot. Here's an example of a lacquer crack. This is a hallmark of degenerative myopia. Notice how you see the choroidal vasculature very, very clearly, and you have a kind of a tilted disc. These are fissures in Brooks membrane, these lacquer cracks, okay? And they could be like a single lacquer crack or several. You can have, they're usually arcuate, but you know, you, they can be nasal also, uh, multiple, or short, or, or, or long, small, you know, thin or thick, it doesn't matter. They all can lead to CNV. Here is a case. This is the same case where here's the lacquer crack on the fluorescein angiography. You can see that this is a myopic fundus because you've got the choroidal atrophy that uh, leads, uh, leaves you, you know, to see the choroidal vessels. Here is the lacquer crack in which through which you see the choroidal vessels very clearly because you don't have RPE and choricapillaris through this, right? It's cracked, it's gone. And here you have a, a kind of a, an unusual, you know, speckled hyperfluorescence uh, very early on. And as soon as you start in the late phases, uh, this there's intense fluorescence and leakage. This is a CNV that has grown from the lacquer crack. In general, the um, CNVs in degenerative myopia tend to be uh, smaller than uh, and more compact than in AMD. They tend to be closer to the fovea and the neurosensor retinal detachment can be very discreet and you don't have a lot of hemorrhages and you, and you practically never have lipid, but uh, they can be active nevertheless and they may require still several uh, treatments. Here's another one um, in which you have several lack of cracks. Here we go. Here you can see them, lack of cracks, and you got a CNV. You got early hyperfluorescence and then uh, uh, late leakage. And you can see this brownish uh, pigment here, which signals that the CNV has been going on for a while. This is what we call a Fuchs spot. So another um, uh, pathology that can give, that can give choroidal neovascularization is uh, android streaks. Again, because you have breaks in Brooks membrane that uh, radiate um, um, around the optic nerve that look like vessels. Um, this condition uh, is idiopathic most of the time, but sometimes it's associated with sickle cell anemia or with a pseudoxanthoma elasticum or Paget's uh, disease. Um, similarly, the CNVs in cases of android streaks tend to be also ominous. They tend to have poor prognosis. They a lot and you need to follow them and treat them promptly and not lose uh, follow-up, okay? A choroidal rupture, traumatic choroidal ruptures, of course, again, same mechanism. You're irritating the Brooks membrane choriocapillaris complex. Therefore, you can, a rupture can let the CNV vessels grow through it and you get CNV primarily within the first two years after um, a trauma, okay? So the, these generally happen after, you know, a closed globe injury, uh, contusion, um, where you get these breaks in the in the choroid and you get uh, these uh, grayish lesions, you know, that leak on a fluorescein angiogram. And the, the longer the, the choroidal rupture is and the closer it is to the fovea, the higher the chance that there is a choroidal rupture. So if you have somebody with trauma uh, and has a choroidal rupture, you should give the patient an Amstel grid and tell him or her to watch the vision very closely. And it should any metamorphopsia happen, the patient should ref, you know, come uh, prompt evaluation because uh, especially in the first two years, they are likely, they can get CNVs. Here's again, another example of multiple choroidal rupture after trauma. Here's the little classic CNV. We see it right there. And here it is in the late phases of the angiogram where it leaks and it's very hyperfluorescent. Uh, idiopathic CNV is when you look for any, all causes and you don't see anything. This, this tends to happen mostly in young people. Okay, you, you get the full signs of the CNV, but you don't know what the cause is, and they're treated also with anti-VEGF. Uh, CNV uh, can also happen, you know, next to the optic nerve, particularly in after um, uh, uh, an episode where the optic nerve may have swelled, um, uh, basically like in the Koenagi Harada uh, condition or uh, in a papilledema. Uh, condition or even optic nerve hydrosin, when you have a swelling of the optic nerve or an enlargement of the optic nerve, this can create conduits through which the uh, choriocapillaries can grow and create a choroidal neovascularization. All right. Now, so how do you treat? 
Well, remember one thing is that CNV is really a serious macular uh, vi central vision threat. So it requires pump treatment and serial follow-up. And at this point, until now, we still do not have a treatment that completely prevents it or eradicates it. So it's going to require a lot of work from both the doctor and the patient to uh, treat promptly with uh, to kind of, uh, you know, s silence the CNV rather than eradicate it. And it needs a very, very long follow up and prompt uh, uh, treatment. So what are the treatments? Well, there are lots of treatments. And when you know that there are lots of treatments, you know that <laughs> uh, people are trying everything because nothing really works 100%. But we are so lucky now compared to 20 years ago when there was there we had very few options, you know, to treat CNV. I'm going to talk about these options very quickly. Uh, nowadays, uh, basically, everybody gets treated with anti-VEGF, uh, but that's going to change, I think, uh, probably in the next 10 years as well. All right. So, uh, the treatment of the CNV is going to depend on the location, the type, and the associated condition, okay, which are AMD, myopia, you know, and all these conditions that I talked to you about. Now, uh, what happens if you have an extra foveal? If you have a CNV that's far, that's, let's say, remember, 200 to 2,500 from the center of the FAZ. Well, I will tell you that 99% of us are right now going to do uh, an anti-VEGF treatment, okay? But I, I want you also to know that if you don't have anti-VEGF treatment, there is a possibility in experienced hands to give laser to the CNV. Of course, it has its own uh, complications, but it's better than letting the CNV, if you don't have any anti-VEGF one day, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to treat with laser, the extra foveal ones, all right? So it, it is a viable option, but really in selected cases, and this is in bold and italicized and underlined, so you do not jump to this unless you are desperate, okay? So what it does is that the laser is going to destroy, it's going to kill, burn, okay, the CNV to protect the fovea. In order to do this, you have to have a very fantastic fluorescein angiograph and that shows the boundaries of the lesion very, very clearly. And the aim of the treatment is to kill the CNV while you preserve the uh, retina. Okay, uh, next to it, I'm not going to go through these details, but we used to we used to do um, these treatments aiming at a very white lesion, you know, to to treat it really well. The problem is that about half of these patients have half of these lesions are going to recur, and unfortunately, most of the recurrence always happens um, towards the foveal side. So uh, it is not the best treatment, and therefore uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. But just rem remember it as a possibility. Now. The other treatment, which is now the most common treatment, is the angio, uh, anti angiogenic treatment, which is to selectively occlude it. So, what I mentioned before was to destroy it. The other, men, the other modality is to occlude it, and we're going to occlude it. We have two ways to occlude it, either with anti VEGFs or with photodynamic therapy. I'm going to talk about this. Or you can cut off the blood supply. Okay, of the CNV, or you can try to remove it surgically, all right? Or if you cannot do any of those, then you try to remove the retina away from it, which is something that we don't do anymore. That is called a macular translocation surgery, okay? Very, very um, wild idea at the time, worked, but with a lot of complications. Let's go back to reality, which is the anti-angiogenic treatment for CNV. And this is currently the treatment of choice, which is inhibiting the VEGF. Um, um, and it allows the two hit strategy. So you, it's, it basically decreases the proliferation of the vessels and it decreases also the permeability of vessels. All right. So this anti-angiogenic uh, anti -angiogenic approach, we used the first one was uh, with something called macugen with this pegaptanib sodium. Again, intravitreal injection, which uh, uh, was directed for just only the isoform A of the, anti of the VEGF molecule. Uh, it was effective, but not as effective as the, the uh, other agents that uh, basically inhibit all the isoforms of the VEGF molecule. And the ones that you guys know, because you, you, you see this all the time, is the ranibizumab, which we used to call Rufab. It's called Lucentis. Uh, the Bevacizumab, Avastin, and the Aflibercept, or VEGF eye trap, which is the ILEA. All right. Now, um, the Lucentis trials, okay, used 
uh, were the first trials directed where the anti vegf were used specifically to uh, treat uh, choroidal neovascularization, okay? So uh, the, the good thing about the Lucent is that it penetrates all the retinal layers and it inactivates all isoforms of anti vegf but you need multiple injections and you get visual improvement in about 40 to 50% uh, of eyes and you get a stabilization and it's relatively safe and tolerated, but it is very expensive, okay? Many, 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 many trials you know, uh, that, uh, you know, that use Lucentis to see its efficacy, its safety, and its long-term uh, outcome. Uh, too much to, to know and to, to talk about in one lecture, and you, it's probably not necessary, but those trials are in the handout that I'm going to give to you. Just remember these three trials because they're most important, the ANCHOR trial, the MARINA, and the CAT. Okay, now the anchor trial, these are pivotal trials. These are trials that, that basically said, this is the way to go. We're gonna treat with anti vegf from now on because it's much better than what we used to have, which was photodynamic therapy, vertiporfin photodynamic therapy. So the initial trials, uh, basically uh, compared the uh, in the setting of AMD, okay, not in myopia, in the setting of AMD, um, uh, the uh, utilization of ranibizumab or Lucentis versus versus vertiporfin, and it definitely showed that the monthly ranibizumab was so much superior than PDT because it maintained or improved vision. People with PDT continue to decrease vision uh, decreased, and uh, with those with uh, uh, with the um, uh, Lucentis, initially they had an, an increase in vision, which was something new, you know, when it happened. It was, we were so excited about it, because now for one, you know, you're seeing improvement of vision, and then you see stabilization of vision. The MARINA study was uh, kind of similar, but they compared um, eyes uh, against sham, uh, and uh, the this was in the minimally classic or the occult CNB, not in the classic ones, all right? And the same thing, uh, basically, it provided better uh, improvement of vision and better uh, stabilization, and there was very few uh, side effects. So these uh, studies were published, and they basically uh, changed our way uh, and our standard of care for um, for the treatment of CNV, but the problem is that uh, you needed monthly monitoring and dosing, monthly, monthly. And you've got these other trials that show you here that if you give a three monthly, for instance, the PEER trial, this is was a small trial where you gave three monthly injections and then you gave quarterly. Every three months you give one injection. Well, the vision was better than CHAM, but not as good as monthly treatment. You have the sailor and the sustain. You, you give three monthly injections and then basically it decreases as soon as you start going into the PRN regimen. So again, you need monthly injections. Excite, you know, a uh, trial. You do three monthly injections and uh, basically you, uh, it shows you that the monthly treatment provided the highest gain compared to the quarterly treatment. Pronto trial, same thing, horizon trial, which showed that after two years, basically the effects got down and people started losing vision, uh, partly because they were not maintained uh, on monthly injections anymore uh, uh, or, or they lost follow-up, okay? so. Uh, so that is the the saga of uh, with the, with the anti vegf treatment. Now you all know Avastin. Avastin is the bevacizumab. It's uh, very similar to uh, it's a large, much larger molecule than the, than the than the Lucentis. Okay, and the dose is. Um, uh, 1.25 milligrams. Uh, again, it's given every four weeks. It has a slightly longer half-life than the ranibizumab and is definitely cheaper. Uh, and it caused a lot of, uh, you know, discussions whether the, it was as effective or not as effective. And this is why we had the CAT trial, which was a head-to-head -head trial uh, of Avastin versus Lucentis in AMD. So the patients were randomized. Uh, half of the patients got ranibizumab. Uh, of these half, you know, half of the half, that is a quarter got the ranibizumab monthly and a quarter got the ranibizumab PRN. And then the same thing with the Avastin, a quarter got them monthly and a quarter got them PRN. And basically they uh, compared them to, to each other. And the conclusions is that they, were, they had equivalent effects on visual acuity when they were given according to schedule. And the best uh, outcomes were when the treatment was monthly and not PRN. Uh, and uh, the ranibizumab dried the eyes a little bit better, okay? Um, and then the uh, monthly evaluation with PRN ranibizumab gave the same outcomes and uh, uh, that this rigorous, you know, uh, even if you don't give ev um, an injection every month, even if you give it PRN, you still have to bring in the patient every month to make sure that the patient is not collecting fluid. Uh, so it's still a, a huge management burden, okay? And uh, uh, there were, you know, similar side effects uh, systemically. 
the, um, uh, the one that came after that was aflibercept, ILEA, which is a fusion protein that has a higher binding affinity to the VEGF. And the studies that uh, evaluated the, this aflibercept were the VIEW studies, OK? Um, basically, I'm not going to bore you here. What it shows you is that if you give a loading dose, you can probably extend the interval of treatment to two months. That means give an injection every two months instead of uh, every month. And it showed what it was compared to nanibizumab. It was more or less equivalent. So the nice thing about aflibercept is that you can in a big proportion of patients extend the treatment interval, which decreases the proportion. Now, all these, all these treatments have complications. You know, you can, you can have ocular complications, you know, like high IOP, uh, hemorrhages, um, um, you know, eventually retinal atrophy, but also endophthalmitis and, uh, um, and uh, retinal breaks and so forth. But also, you know, anti-VEGF um, uh, inhibition can cause hypertension, can cause myocardial infarctions and uh, thromboembolic effects. So you have to be very careful when you select those patients for these things, okay? Now, so these are the three ones that you know, the bevacizumab, ranibizumab, aflibercept. Here they are. And the, the Combercept is, is similar to aflibercept. It's a molecule that is used in China, okay? And then there's the new one that you're going to probably hear about more and more. It's called brolocizumab. It's made by Novartis. And it's supposedly, uh, can you can extend the treatment to three months instead of two months in between injection. However, however, there are serious side effects with this uh, in about one to 2% of people. Uh, they can have, have um, you know, blinding retinal vasculitis and inflammation. So this is not so safe, in my opinion, as yet. And there's another one, which is called Episipar. Uh, this was uh, did not get uh, FDA approval earlier this year because it caused a lot of inflammation. So what you need to remember is that the anti-VEGF treatment is a mainstay right now of treatment. Uh, it inhibits leakage and proliferation, but continuous therapy is required. And this is a major burden and you lose the effect when you discontinue the treatment and you can get even rebound effects. But what's new and what's new may be exciting, okay, but not as uh, exciting as what I'm gonna tell you towards the end if I still have time. So what's new is that now there are um, studies that are um, uh, studying the, um, the uh, surgically implanted reservoir, which are a tiny little reservoir um, um, the, in which you uh, inject um, uh, Lucentis inside it, and then you basically uh, insert it surgically at the level of the pars plana, and it releases the Lucentis uh, slowly into the eye for, and you know, supposedly the effect lasts for six months. So you don't get the spikes on up and down of VEGF inhibition. You get a very slow um, and steady uh, VEGF uh, inhibition. Uh, there have been problems with it, some vitreous hemorrhages, uh, extrusions, uh, endophthalmitis, as with any foreign body, of course, with co conjunctival erosion. So those things are possible, but it would definitely mean a lot to the patients if they can have a treatment every six months. They come in and they get the reservoir refilled instead of coming every month for treatment. And that, now people are also experimenting with more depot formulations. Now, we talked about the occlusion, occlusion of the CNV with antigenic treatment. We also, one way of occluding it is with photodynamic therapy, which is what we had 20 years ago. Uh, we use a, a product called Visodyne. The Visodyne is injected into the arm it basically goes throughout the circulation. And then we shine a specific light, um, kind of a reddish light here, you know, especially with diode, you know, at the, uh, on the lesion itself uh, after a specific time. Uh, we give the injection of the Visodyne. We wait. Um, the injection is given, for, you know, on uh, throughout 10 minutes, and then five minutes after the end of the injection, we uh, uh, expose the CNV lesion uh, for 83 seconds to the slight. Uh, what this does is that it's going to activate. Uh, it's going to like uh, uh, you know create um, free radicals in the in the um, in the CNV complex, which is going to damage the wall and cause the CNV to occlude by thrombosis. But then with time, the CNV opens again. Three months later, you know within three months, it's really open and you have to do it again. So this is what we used to do. Like every three months, we would treat people with, with the PDT. Um, I'm not going to go through the details here, but, you know, we, we had um, a kind of, you know, the complications is that you can get photosensitive reactions. People can get burns if they expose the light. You get RPE damage and you can kill the core capillaries and cause, you know, visual loss. So, um, and the most 
problematic thing was that you had no improvement of vision, you know, uh, with anti-vege, if you can, um, you know, hope for improvement of vision and improvement of vision does exist, but with the PDT, it does not. And of course, the, you needed repeated treatment. So at, at this point, in terms of CNV treatment, we just give it as an adjunctive treatment. Therefore, if you have a CNV and you're treating it, you're going to treat it with anti-VEGF. If you need something extra, something to help, particularly if you have a polypoidal lesion, okay, or if you have a RAP lesion, then you can uh, add PDT to, you know, augment the effect. Now, other treatment strategies, and those are we practically do not do these anymore, okay? One, one way is to cut off the blood supply, which is a feeder vessel treatment, okay? You identify based on ICG, the blood vessel that is the mama vessel, if you wish, that feeds the CNV complex, and you try with laser to burn that to kind of occlude it, and you get this, you know, washout here. Maybe this will, will uh, get some... Uh, uh, you know, get some people excited in the future with the OCTA to start doing, a, you know, feeder vessel treatment. I don't know, but this is, we practically don't do it. And it requires a lot of skill, okay? And it requires really, really uh, sophisticated angiography, okay, to, to see it, all right? Um, submacular surgery was done at a time where we didn't have anything else, where we didn't even have PDT. Uh, you can do surgery. It doesn't work very well, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you do a vitrectomy, uh, you peel the hyaloid, and then you do a little retinotomy to you create, put a little bit of fluid uh, under the retina, you know, basically balloon the retina and then come with, with little forceps, tease the uh, CNV out and, you know, kind of drag it out of the retinotomy and then fill the air, fill the eye or the vitreous right, with, with air and put the patient face down. The problem is sometimes you can rip the RPE and you get a lot of RPE loss. And if you get RPE loss, of course, then there is no, uh, you know, um, thing to, to nourish the chorea capillaris. So uh, the vision does not really improve, okay? It used to work well, well, well is, is relative. It used to work better, let's put it this way, in classic membranes due to inflammation, okay? Uh, because those, as I said, are above the RPE, all right? But if you have an AMD where most of the <laughs> CNV is under the RPE, you can imagine that if you go there, you try to tease the, 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 the membrane from under the RPE, you're going to create a lot of blood, okay, and ripping of the RPE, and you're not going to get any visual improvement. So this, people have really abandoned this. And the other innovative treatment, which came out in 1997, okay, was the macular translocation, which is you do a um, uh, you do a vitrectomy, you detach the retina, and then basically once you detach the retina, you rotate the retina so that the fovea doesn't sit anymore on the, on the, you know, where it used to be on, on top of the CNV, but kind of maybe some either inferiorly or superiorly there, for instance, inferiorly um, to uh, you basically translocate it to a place where the RPE is healthier. Okay, this causes distortion of uh, vision, of course, uh, you have tilted vision and uh, difficult ambulation, and you can get, uh, you know, the eye can get PVR, you know, fibrosis, retinal detachment, uh, hypotony, you know, all sorts of uh, complications. So with the anti-VEGF, practically people uh, have stop doing this all together. Now, but something is really exciting uh, that's coming up in the pipes, okay, and it's in the phase 2b and starting phase 3 trials, which is the subretinal gene therapy and the intravitreal gene therapy. Now, these are really exciting news. Um, the uh, the subretinal gene therapy basically is going to use an, a vector, um, the same as we use um, in, uh, in uh, you know, gene therapy for retinitis pigmentosa, for instance. We're going to use a, an AAV vector, an attenuated adenovirus vector to deliver an, uh, an antibody, an anti-VEGF antibody that's going itself infect the cells and, you know, create uh, in vivo laboratory of anti-VEGF uh, molecules, okay? And I'm not going to go into the details, but the the initial study you utilized, you know, escalating doses, and um, the these were sub, you know, in the, this requires surgery, of course. You know, you're going to inject this under the um, under the retina in people who have failed. Uh, well, who responded? Let's put it this way: who responded to aflibercept, but who could never get weaned off um, anti uh, aflibercept. They needed it on a monthly basis, and sometimes even even less than a monthly basis. So those patients were getting tired of the injections. Uh, those those are the kind of people that were enrolled in the study, and the, this uh, cohort number uh, five, which received the highest dose, uh, and these, uh, there were 12 patients enrolled, and nine of the 12 patients were injected 
once and they needed no more injection. Uh, and you know, they were injection free for six months and some even more. So this is very, very exciting. And the other one is the intravitreal gene therapy for neovascular AMD, which is called the OPTIC trial, which also uses a, a vector. Okay, it's called ADVM222, which is an intravitreal gene therapy that is designed purposefully, you know, for the long-term uh, uh, suppression of uh, uh, of uh, VEGF by by an intravitreal production of aflibercept. It's amazing. Okay, so one single in-office use uh, intravitreal injection uh, basically can treat the patients with wet AMD for for a long, long time. Now, mind you, these are preliminary results. These are still in trials, but if this works, this would be great. Uh, and it basically, this treatment is going to be transformative, okay? It's going to, do, to reduce the treatment burden that that uh, both for the patients and for the doctors. Okay, last two slides is that remember that the natural history in AMD is quite poor. The eyes, if you have a CNV1 eye, then there's a high risk of legal blindness and uh, the risk of blindness increases uh, uh, when you, you know, if I mean, AMD, there's a high risk of blindness, but the risk, the risk is even higher when, when there is a CNV. A careful monitoring of patients is crucial. You have to counsel them, reassure them, give them an Amstel grid, uh, perhaps start you know, with a home uh, OCT device that's now being used in some areas in the world you know, where people can monitor their vision themselves, they monitor the OCT and can send those images to their doctors. And if the doctor sees anything that's wrong, you know, bring, basically brings them in and, and, you know, injects them or treats them. Uh, multivitamins uh, are recommended. But if you have a healthy diet, you probably don't need that. But the, um, and uh, the, uh, this is basically the patient severity scale. Like if you have large drusen, this is a, you know, a, um, 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 an, an what do you call it, like a marker for severity if you have pigment changes, yes. So if you have drusen and pigment changes in one eye, you already have two. If you have them in both eyes, that's four. And basically, depending on the severity score, the risk um, of vision loss at five, you know, if let's say the patient has this uh, two um, uh, large drusen pigment changes in both eyes, then the score is four and the five risk of vision loss is 50%, okay, very, very high. So uh, the added study is a prophylactic, you basically is a study, huge study that uh, studied the effect of vitamin therapy, vitamin C, beta carotene, and zinc to lessen the uh, evolution into uh, late AMD, okay, um, and used uh, uh, lutein and zeaxanthin to supplement the uh, intrinsic, uh, you know, macular pigment. Um, and it was, it is recommended to give these vitamins to people who have category three disease uh, or, um, uh, and to non-smokers. Uh, patient education rehabilitation is very important. Again, I, you know, people need to monitor their vision. Uh, you need to tell the patient that they'll never completely become blind, okay? It's just the central vision. Of course, it's hugely important, but you know, people are really afraid of becoming totally blind, but actually it's the central visual loss that happens. Uh, people will always be you know, able to distinguish night from day and navigate and go to the bathroom and, you know, and eat and walk by themselves. Um, magnifiers are important. People need to you know, get to have some adjustments, uh, you know, use brighter illumination for reading, use iPads and, and you know, larger print, um, get psychological support and low vision aid. And that's very, very important. And with this, I'm done and on time. So we have a few minutes for questions, I guess. And uh, that's it. Any questions? You can un unmute yourself and we will address your questions. I have 111 participants. So maybe one will have a question. <laughs> Is anybody there? Um, I'm, I'm not very good with chat. So if anybody wants to go ahead and, and ask the question verbally, that would be much easier for me. Um, yes, it's hearing you. Yes, alaikum salam. This is Marwan speaking. Hi, Marwan. Hi. Uh, thank you for uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, a question that always uh, is always asked uh, around yes. uh, between residents and uh, to us attendings: How common is uh, colloidal neovascularization compared to, I mean, uh, the AMD 
bad compared to the Western world? You know, I, I don't have real statistics, but I can tell you if, you if you're doing medical retina like me, I see a lot. OK, so and I think now with the with the more, more awareness of people and easier referral, it, we're, we're seeing this much easier. Of course, it's by no means as frequent as diabetes. Uh, I know in the West that uh, AMD is extremely prevalent, OK, particularly in an older population in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it is becoming more prevalent because people are getting older, but most of our population is young. So they're not going to get AMD now, but I think with the exposure to all those lights uh, and the changes in our food, um, you know, uh, regimen, um, fast food and perhaps smoking, you know, we're increasing our risk in the future. But I'm seeing much more AMD cases now than I used to see, let's say, 15 years ago. Uh, do you think race has anything to do with it? Like, uh, I've never seen it in a AMD, uh, with AMD in a, a black person. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The, um, I, think, I think the melanin, if it's uh, very intense, it may be protective uh, from light, okay? Because it acts as a screen and therefore you have probably less RPE damage and less choroidal damage because you have a, you have a thicker screen that prevents um, the light from, you know, basically causing havoc in the, in the cells. Um, it is definitely a disease that comes in with the, in a lighter, you know, uh, uh, lighter colored people, you know, where, the, where the, the skin is lighter. And most of the people I've seen here tend to have lighter skin. That doesn't mean that they're all, you know, very, very uh, white, like Syrian people. You know, I've, I have some people who have originally come from Jordan or Palestine or uh, Syria, you know, and they, and they tend to have really bad uh, CNV. But when you look at them, they're not, they're not that dark. Um, but they're not also very fair skinned like the, the the white people that we see, the Caucasians, you know, that we see in Europe. Uh, but then there, there are really uh, some some Saudis who who are, you know, I would say regular have a regular skin color, not not, not really dark, and they have it and they have it yet. I have not seen AMD in black either. I, I agree to that. Yes, myself. And, and the melanin probably will help, just like it helps a little bit with melanoma as well. You know, um, black people tend to have less melanoma because you know their their uh, the pigment epithelium probably is you know the melanin in the pigment epithelium is protective, and perhaps the iris too. Yeah. Thanks, Lefty. You're welcome. You, it's nice to hear from you, Marwan. Haven't seen anybody in real life for a long time. It's nice to hear your voices. <laughs> you too. Do we have any other questions or can maybe, no, I think we have to stop. So if anybody wants, has a burning question, you guys can email me, okay? And I will be sharing um, a handout that has the, uh, the studies if you guys want to have more information on those. And thank you very much.